one more minute. Okay, just one sec, one more minute. And we will get started. So while we're waiting, maybe you can turn off your phones, and Dr. Loris will do the same thing. Hi, sister. So everybody turned off their phone? Good. I, th I think we'll get started. There might be a couple of more people coming in. Um, but welcome uh, to today's Center for Catholic Studies lecture. Um, and today, uh, we're really most grateful and honored to present the annual uh, Les Bylas and Ellen Lubell Endowed Lecture for Jewish Christian understanding, uh, and the center is really most fortunate to have Les and Ellen as our supporters and our friends. And um, before we begin, I just want to take a minute to introduce them to you. Um, Les and Ellen, would you stand for a minute? All right. Do you think you can stand while I do this? Yeah, it'll only take a minute. She's such a re rebel. <laughs> so Les was an attorney in private practice in Westport for some 50 years, and he also served as U.S. Uh, assistant U.S. attorney. He uh, is also a man who serves his community and gives back to the community. For three decades, he served on the board of directors at the Jewish Home for the Elderly, and for a decade, he was active in the Hole in the Wall gang uh, with its fundraising efforts. His wife and the love of his life, Ellen Lubell, was a family lawyer in Westport for more than 40 years. And uh, her nickname in the courts was the Tiger Lady, which uh, tells you why she was listed regularly uh, in Best Lawyers in America. Ellen, too serves and gives back to the community. She has been active at the Domestic Violence Crisis Center where she was a former board president and now serves on the advisory board. She is an avid and contributing member of Planned Parenthood of New England. And most recently, we are so glad and most fortunate to have Ellen as a member of the College of Arts and Science uh, member as a board uh, on the Board of Visitors. Ellen and Les's philanthropic contributions are wide and varied, and now we here at the Center for Catholic Studies are most fortunate and grateful to them for their generous support of this endowed lecture on Jewish Christian understanding. And more than that, we're really fortunate that they are our good friends, and so please join me in thanking them. Uh, and now I'd like to um, just grab a seat. There are a bunch of seats up here. Come on. Uh, 
I'd like to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Kara Kilgallen, Associate Professor in the Department of Language and Literature, and Kara will introduce uh, today's speaker. Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, thank you so much to um, Les and Ellen for your tremendous generosity and for making these conversations possible. So I'm honored to be here, and thank you, Dr. Loris, for all that you do. Um, so as a Jewish professor of English literature and writing, myself, who has long lived, who has long learned, lived, and taught in Catholic educational institutions, I feel honored today to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Deborah Schoenfeld. Today's talk, The Bible as a Contested Text, The Bible and Jewish Christian Understanding in the Middle Ages and Today, resonates closely with Sacred Heart University Center for Catholic Studies, which promotes programming, teaching, and scholarship that demonstrates our mission, which is rooted in the Catholic intellectual tradition, as inspired by Vatican II, a pivotal part of which is interfaith dialogue and discourse. Dr. Schoenfeld is an associate professor in the Department of Theology at Loyola University, Chicago. She earned her doctorate from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley and a master's from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Her research focuses on medieval biblical commentaries in the context of Jewish-Christian connections. Dr. Schoenfeld has published also on Talmudic dream interpretations and on proof for God's existence in medieval Jewish thinking and writing. That one really fascinates me. In 2012, her book, Isaac, on Jewish and Christian altars, Genesis 22 in Rashi and the Glossa Ordinaria, was published by Fordham University Press. So please let us extend a warm welcome to Dr. Devorah Schoenfeld. Thank you, and thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I very much appreciate being here. One of the things that I've seen already is this is a place where people listen carefully to each other, which is a great start for interreligious dialogue. All right. If there's one thing I would like you to get out of today's talk, it's to stop when you hear the words the Bible says. The Bible's a book. It doesn't talk. It can't speak. People have to read the Bible. The nature of human beings is that humans have agency. People have free will. People make choices. When people read the Bible, they make choices. When people come to the Bible, there are specific kinds of choices that they have to make as biblical readers. These choices are going to find different meanings out of the biblical text. These choices are going to find different stories in the biblical text. They're going to find different stories in the same text, and it will become a contested text. All right, what kinds of choices do people have to make? First of all, where do you start? You could start from the beginning. How far would you get? Um, you could try to read very quickly. OK, but then that's also a choice. Um, sometimes, when people start at the beginning, they tend to focus on the stories at the beginning. And then it looks like the Bible is about universal history, about creation, about the flood. Okay, but that's only really the first few chapters. That's not mostly what the Bible is about. Okay. Um, mostly when people come to the Bible, or a lot of the time when people come to the Bible, they start with the theme. They start with a question. So let's try. If you were to look in the Bible for a story about um, pushing back against God, God wants something. Someone does not want this thing that God wants. Someone disagrees with God. What story would you go to? OK. Jacob's Ladder, OK. Someone wanting something that's different than what God wants. Abraham and Isaac, OK. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is one I get a lot, OK. It's interesting how these different starting points would get you to different places. If the story you start with is the story of Adam and Eve, okay, God tells you to do something, 
the people push back against it, and it goes, again, according to most interpretations, not very well. There are interpretations that read it more positively, but okay. Um, Job might take you to a different place. God torments Job for a not obvious reason, because Satan challenges him to. Then Job's friends come and give an explanation for it, and Job says, your explanations are all wrong. And then God appears out of a whirlwind and calls everyone a bunch of idiots. Um, <laughs> all right, it's a much more ambiguous message. Um, if you go to Abraham arguing with God, then it becomes a positive message of arguing with God. Okay, you already see um, what's, how, the, how you could get very different messages out of the Bible, because what story are you thinking about and what's gonna drive your selection of stories? So it might be what stories do you know? Um, the Bible is full of stories. The Bible has lots of different stories. Um, or it might be, what stories does your community retell the most? What, story, what stories is your community the most familiar with? Now, the Bible, and here I speak about the Hebrew Bible, is a very complex, multivocal text that was written and or revealed over the course of about a thousand years and takes place over the course of about a thousand years. I should asterisk the reason I say written and or revealed. I like to say in my classes, there's no requirement in this class to believe anything or to not believe anything. This course should work if you believe that the Bible was word by word dictated from God. And this course should work if you believe that the Bible was written by a bunch of people who you don't like any of them. Um, so um, there is a diversity of perspectives within both Judaism and, Christ and Catholicism about how the Bible came to be. But even if you believe that the Bible was word to word, word for word dictated by God, surely you can imagine that if God were to speak today, and if God were to speak 200 years ago in Texas, it might sound a little bit different. Yeah? Um, and 300 years from now in Alaska, that might sound a little bit different. Yeah? OK. So even if it was word for word revealed by God, um, the fact that it happened over a long period of time, things are going to sound a little bit different. OK. So very many different stories, um, very many different time periods, no unity of character or plot. Um, now, in the Hebrew Bible, sometimes um, Christians will ask me, who is the Jewish counterpart to Jesus? Who's the Jewish parallel to Jesus? And the truth is, there really isn't one. Um, the New Testament has Jesus as a central organizing figure, that the Gospels tell the story of Jesus from different perspectives. And then um, following that, we hear the stories of the disciples of Jesus, and the, we see the letters of the disciples of Jesus. Um, but there's no central organizing figure in the Hebrew Bible. So Moses is not the parallel to Jesus. Moses is important in the books that he's important in, and there are many other books. Um, if there is one central protagonist of the Hebrew Bible, it's the Jewish people. Um, again, starting after chapter 12 of Genesis. Um, but, um, but, but it's the Jewish people who go by different names, who are living in different places. Okay, so um, Bible's very complex text that's gonna look different depending where you look. And the person who reads it is making choices. How do you start? Where do you start? Where do you go to with your questions? Okay. Um, next question. You've now started at a certain place. Let's say you've started with the story of Adam and Eve, or you've started with the story of Job. How do you connect between that part of the Bible and other parts of the Bible? How do you deal with the differences between the, the different biblical passages, the different biblical stories that may take different perspectives on different questions, different events, um, even different moral issues. Okay. Now, one option, if you're not reading as a religious person, is just to say, 
Okay, so there's different historical perspectives written by different people who all lived a long time ago, and I don't like any of them, so they were just all different people who had different perspectives. Okay, that works fine if none of these perspectives have a claim on you, but what if they do? What if you are someone who is looking to these perspectives for guidance, and you wanna figure out what do I do with them? How do you connect to them? How do you put the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Job and the story of Abraham arguing with God together? Okay, so the Bible is a complex and multivocal text which requires people to make choices when they read it. How do you start? How do you draw connections between the different pieces if that's something that you're gonna do? All right. My own work is on the Song of Songs interpretation in particular. The Song of Songs is a book of the Bible which is about love. Who here's read the Song of Songs? Just to get a, get a sense. Oh, good, a lot of you. Okay, you know this already. Um, the Song of Songs is a collection of poems that are about love. I'm calling it a collection of poems. Other people who have written on it will call it a love story or a love song. Um, the reason I'm calling it a, a collection is that, as I will argue in a moment, there is no unity in the Song of Songs of place, character, or setting. Um, but there is unity of theme, which is love. It is all about love. Um, and the, the protagonists are men and women who are speaking about love. Um, God isn't mentioned, at least not directly. Because of this, it can be a challenging book. Now, often the challenge that people find in it is, wait, why is there a book of love poetry that doesn't mention God in the Bible? Okay, that's a very common challenge that people find in the Song of Songs. Um, but when I look at it, I see another challenge, which is, why is there this book that has no unity of plot, character, or setting, and yet people persist in reading it as a single story? Anyway, so in your introduction, you mentioned my previous book from, I don't even want to think about how long ago, but this is the book that I'm working on now. It's on, um, it's on Song of Songs commentaries and how they construct a single story out of the different love poems in the Song of Songs. Um, and what I'm going to argue is that classical and medieval Jewish and Christian commentators use the Song of Songs as a way to try to find unity in the Bible, as a way to, through drawing unity, through creating a love story in Song of Songs, create a love story between God and God's people through the Bible. All right. But before we get to that, let, let's actually look at some texts from Song of Songs. And I'll make my point about the Song of Songs not being a single story. All right, passage number one. This is the first piece of Song of Songs. Um, Song of Songs, chapter one, verses two to four. Oh, give me of the kisses of your mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Your ointments yield a sweet fragrance. Your name is like finest oils. Therefore, do maidens love, me, love you? Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Let us re delight and rejoice in your love, savoring it more than wine. Like new wine, they love you. Okay, great. Um, the man, who is he? It says clearly. Who's the guy? King. Who's the woman? Someone in a relationship with the king, right? Um, not clear. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's not clear if she's a king's wife. Could potentially, you could imagine she's a king's concubine, but you know, probably want to imagine she's a king's wife. Um, actually, I said wife. What status is a relationship? Where are they? Getting together, got together, where are they? 
Unmarried, married. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're already in the relationship. They've, they've already kissed. She's already able to describe his kisses. Um, they're already mid, they, they are in the early stages of a relationship. Okay, king and someone who he is already in a relationship with, in the palace, in the early stages of a relationship. Um, all right, um, emotional state, intoxication. All right, she is thrilled with him. Okay, note by the way, this is um, from the woman's point of view. A lot of Song of Songs is from the woman's point of view. Um, okay, all right, next passage. Um, this is from later in chapter one. Tell me you whom I love so well, where do you pasture your sheep? Where do you rest them at noon? Let me not be one who strays besides the flocks of your fellows. If you do not know, O fairest of women, go follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your kids by the tents of the shepherds. They're not, king, they're not a king and a, a, a queen anymore, are they? Okay, um, all right. So, um, who's the man? Shepherd. Um, who's the woman? A goat herd. Um, where do they live? Not in the palace, somewhere rural. Um, yeah, what is the status of their relationship? So they seem to have an emotional connection, but they're not married. They have to go find a way to, um, to sneak around, to, to get to each other during the day, um, to, find, to find a way to meet during the day. Okay. All right. Next passage. Song of Songs, chapter 3. Um, who is she that comes up from the desert, like the power, like columns of smoke and columns of myrrh, um, of all the powers of the, um, of all the powers of the merchant? Um, oh, um, there is Solomon's couch, um, within it decked in love by maidens of Jerusalem. O oh, maidens, go forth and gaze upon King Solomon, wearing the crown that his mother gave him on his wedding day, on his day of bliss. All right, who's the man? King, not just a king, but King Solomon. Status of the relationship? Getting married. All right. So here we have the actual wedding. All right. Um, so, so um, and it's very, and it's he, but very different emotional tone, very formal. Okay. Um, passage number four. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. My beloved Knox, um, let me in, my own, my darling. So she's asleep. Her again, this is from the woman's perspective. She's asleep. He's knocking on her door. So presumably they're living separately. She gets up to open the door for him. Um, I had taken off my robe. Was I to don it again? I had bathed my feet. Was I to soil it again? My beloved took his hand off the latch. My heart was stirred from him. Um, I rose up to let my beloved in. Okay, I opened the door for my beloved. I'm in verse six, but my beloved had turned and gone. Um, so she gets up to open the door. He's gone. Um, I, I searched for him. I found him not. I called for him. He did not answer. I met the watchmen who patrol the town. They struck him, they, they struck me, they bruised me. Okay, where are they? They're in a city. Okay, so they're not the shepherd and the goat herd anymore. They're living in a city. Um, but are they a king and a queen? No. Are they married? No. Um, they, um, and are they powerful? No. Uh, it's certainly hard to imagine the watchman of the city beating up the queen or the king's, uh, the, the king's lover, right? Um, so this also seems like a very different kind of story, very, and also a very 
different emotional tone, that the emotional tone here is more longing um, and more wanting the partner and feeling sorrow. There's a tinge of guilt. There's a tinge of, of he came for me and I did not answer. Okay, so these are different love stories. Um, at least the way it seems. It seems like these are different characters in different settings and that there is no unity of plot. Okay. Having said that, overwhelmingly, the classical and medieval commentaries read Song of Songs as having unity of, of unity of plot. When they interpret the Song of Songs, they interpret it as a story. Now, sometimes they'll interpret it as the story of love between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife. Sometimes they'll interpret it as love between God and God's people. Sometimes they'll interpret it as love between God and the individual yearning soul. But it's the overwhelming majority of times, it's a single story. But the stories that they are are very different from each other. And the techniques that they use to find those stories are different from each other. And that's the agency that people have when they read the Bible. How to create a story out of different pieces that don't completely match with each other. All right. Now, I say almost all there are exceptions. Um, one exception, for example, is Midrash Rabbah, um, which interprets each passage of Song of Songs separately. Um, so in the larger project, I also look at some of these exceptions, which do see the Song of Songs as separate passages that each tell its own story. But, okay. Um, but today, I want to look at a couple of commentaries from the Middle Ages, one Jewish, one Christian, who both retell the Song of Songs as a single story. All right. Passage number five. Rashi, Rabbi Solomon ben Isaac, um, writing in uh, medieval France. Um, probably most famous Jewish biblical commentator of all time. Um, people still read him today, um, very much. Um, and he wrote a commentary on the entire Bible, also wrote commentaries on many other Jewish texts. Um, in his commentary of Song of Songs, um, he takes a particular approach that retells the story on two levels. He says, God says one, I hear it, one thing, I hear it two different ways. One text bring, brings forth multiple meanings. And in the end of things, a text does not leave its context and meaning. Okay. So he says, there's two levels to this story. He says, I have seen for this book many agotic interpretations. There are those who explain this book in, all, in one midrash and those who explain it among various different midrashim. So here he's referring to midrash Rabbah and the way it explains the different pieces separately. Um, but he says, I said in my heart to seize the meaning of the text, to set the explanations in order, and I will make each midrash of our image, of, of our sages, fit in its proper place. So he's saying midrash, so by midrash, of course, he means the genre of biblical commentaries written by the rabbis in roughly first to seventh century. Also, well, also later. Um, but um, he's drawing these, uh, these earlier textual sources, narratives, um, retelling biblical stories. So there are many. Um, midrashic passages that retell that deal with Song of Songs, and he says, I'm going to take some of these and I'm going to write a coherent narrative out of them. But he says, I'm going to interpret it on two levels. Okay, let's do the second one first. He says, on one level, this book is based in the metaphor of a woman bound in living widowhood. Um, 
So a woman bound in living widowhood, what this is a reference to, I've bolded all the biblical passages. Interesting thing he does here. He is weaving together biblical passages from other parts of the Bible. Women bound in living wid widowhood, this is a reference to in, um, to in the book of, to a, to a story about King David when um, there are women that he's married to that are captured by his son, and then after that, he doesn't want to live with these women again, but also doesn't want to divorce them. So that's living widowhood. Someone that you're not married to and also don't, aren't willing to divorce. Okay, uh, and that's a bad situation. So he says, that's the situation of Song of Songs. It's a woman who is married to someone who the marriage isn't working out, and they're also not getting divorced. They're living separately, and they're not getting divorced. So woman bound in living widowhood, longing for her husband, leaning on her beloved, remembering the love of her youth for him, and admitting her sins. Her beloved is also suffering with her in her pain. OK, he's referencing here Isaiah. Isaiah here is writing about exile. He's writing about the suffering of exile. Um, and the, so remembers the love of her youth, the beauty of her beauty, and the rightness of her deeds, that with them he was connected with her in a powerful love, so that she might know that he is not causing her suffering from his heart, and her exile is not exile, for she is still his wife and he her husband. Okay, and he will return to her. Okay. Um, that last reference is from the book of Hosea. Anyone here know the story of Hosea? All right, it, the, the story of the, in the beginning of Hosea is a very disturbing story in which God asks the prophet Hosea to marry a woman who, it's not clear, was she formerly a prostitute or was she expected to cheat on him while they were married? It's not clear. And then to divorce her in a really very ugly way uh, or to send her aside in a very ugly way and then to reconcile with her. It's a very disturbing story, but this is intended as a metaphor for God's relationship with the people of Israel. It's a very troubling metaphor. Um, I'm not gonna try to undo how troubling it is because I think Rashi is sitting with how troubling it is. Because that metaphor is how it shows that God will ultimately return to us. That passage from, is from Hosea, that's the end of the story of Hosea. That in the end, Hosea returns to his wife to show that God will ultimately return to us because no matter what, God is our husband, we are God's wife. Okay. So the story that Rashi weaves together out of Song of Songs is that this woman is, once was a queen, once was beloved of her husband, they went on adventures together, things were great between them, but, she, think, but then she kind of messed up. Maybe she cheated on him. There are hints that maybe she committed adultery. Um, and now they're living separately, but they still love each other. Um, and so that scene where he comes to her and knocks on her door, they're living separately because she had left him, and, but he wants to reconcile with her. So he comes and knocks on her door, but she doesn't respond immediately, so he goes looking for her. So it's a story of a estranged husband and wife who are still longing for each other and still hope to reconcile. That's the love story that he finds in Song of Songs. All right, now what's this about? Going back to the middle of the middle paragraph. And I say that King Solomon saw with the Holy Spirit, in the future, the children of Israel will be exiled, exile after exile, destruction after destruction, and they will mourn in this exile over their earlier honor. OK. So this love story about an estranged couple that still love each other, this love story is a metaphor for the enduring relationship between God and Israel. Because the relationship between God and Israel is one in which we are currently in exile. 
it's one in which we are currently suffering. It's one in which we are currently feeling our distance from God. And yet, in this exile, we remember that God loves us. That, for Rashi, is the, song, the story of Song of Songs. And it's also the story of the Bible. By weaving together the different pieces of the Song of Songs, the ways in which the love story of Song of Songs, it's not one story, but he turns it into one story. He also turns the Bible into one story. Because this woman of Song of Songs is the same woman in Lamentations. If you know the Book of Lamentations, the Book of Lamentations mourns over the de destruction of Jerusalem, mourns over the exile of the Judeans as they were taken off to Babylon. Um, and it's also like Song of Songs written mostly in a woman's voice. And it begins with how does she, she's like a widow, the city is like a widow. And Rashi says she's like a widow, but she's not a widow. She's a woman who is temporarily estranged from her husband. It's the same woman. Um, by bringing the Song of Songs together, Rashi brings the Bible together. Rashi brings the different voices in the Bible, the love of Song of Songs and the lament of Lamentations, the amb ambiguity and tension of Hosea, um, the, the belief in the future redemption in Isaiah, um, the, the feeling of chosenness in the book of Exodus, the feeling of God's covenantal love in Exodus, it all comes together into one story by bringing the Song of Songs together into one story. Okay. He's not just bringing the Bible together. Rashi, as he's writing this, is sitting in 12th century France, which was in some ways not the greatest place to be. Um, and he is thinking, hey, when I, as a Jew, think about what it means to love and be, lo be loved by God, I need to affirm that God loves us even when times are hard, even when things feel hard. And things are feeling hard right now. So this is unity, not just of the Bible, but of the Bible and current reality. All right. The next one, I think I'm gonna do a little more briefly. Moving to the 14th century and to Nicholas of Lyra. Um, Nicholas of Lyra actually read Rashi's commentary and was influenced by Rashi's commentary. Um, he was a Franciscan exegete, uh, um, Catholic, um, and he was what was called in medieval times a Hebraist. He was a um, Catholic biblical interpreter who read Hebrew and was interested in Jewish biblical interpretation. Now, that doesn't mean that he always loved Jews. He actually wrote quite a number of things against Jews. Um, but he loved Jewish biblical interpretation and actually loved Rashi's commentary um, and thought that Rashi was right about a lot of things. Um, but when he comes to read the Bible, he actually has a much more complicated problem because he has a much more complicated Bible. Because for him, the Bible includes the New Testament as well. And when I said the Bible takes place so over a course of about a thousand years and was written and or revealed over the course of about a thousand years, I was talking about the Hebrew Bible. Um, if you add in the New Testament, you add in many different voices, a lot of different genres, many more different ways of looking at the world, um, a different language that it was written in Greek rather than Hebrew, um, and the text becomes even more multivocal and complex. All right. So the question of biblical unity is even more complicated for Nicholas of Lyra, and yet he shares the same exegetical commitments as that Rashi does and loves Rashi's commentary. OK. So he writes, Hebrew interpreters, by which he means Rashi, say that this book is a parable which depicts the love between God and the Jews, a love which was promised to them at the giving of the law in Exodus. Um, in Exodus 20, where God claimed them as the bride where he desires, so, the bride that he desires. So here he's referencing Rashi and saying that this is, um, that in the Jewish interpretation, this speaks about God's covenantal love. Okay. Um, 
Catholic expositors common, commonly say this book depicts the love between Christ and the church. Um, so one example of this is the commentary of Bede, who wrote about the Song of Songs as connected to the history of the church and the building of the church and a way of affirming God's love for the church as it continues to build itself. Um, so, they, so they say that the church originated from the side of Christ, okay. Um, so, but he says, both interpretations are incomplete. Um, so he says, both of these interpretations see only part of the story. Now, why do they see only part of the story? Because they see only part of the Bible. Um, he says, some things in the book cannot easily be explained with regard to the situation in the Old Testament. Others can only be explained in regard to the New Testament. Um, so he then goes through um, and shows how different and connects different pieces in the complex narrative of the Song of Songs, some to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old, well, for him, to the Old Testament, and some to the New Testament. And that's why the stories are so different from each other, because some are connected to the Old Testament and some are connected to the New Testament. That's why the tone is so different. That's why the voices are so different, because it's because they are telling the story of the whole community of God. For Nicholas of Lyra, the Song of Songs is a story about the love between God and God's people. But God's people has changed throughout history. In the time of the Hebrew Bible, God's people was the Jews. At a certain point, God's people became the church. But it's one story. So by creating this unity within Song of Songs, he also creates this unity between what he understands as the two parts of history, the biblical the, and the two the 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 two peoples of God, um, which he sees as two aspects of one people. Um, he also, by doing this, connects between the Bible and contemporary reality. As a Christian interpreter who loves to read Jewish Bible commentaries and loves to read the Hebrew Bible, he's he's taken aback by how different right, many of these are from his own interpretations and the own received Catholic tradition. So both of these are part of one people of God. He finds unity in the different voices of the Song of Songs. All right, in both of these cases, the different interpreters draw a thread through the voices of Song of Songs to create a unity. I could give you other examples from the Middle Ages, and in the larger project that I'm working on, I have lots of examples from the Middle Ages. Um, but I said I would bring some modern examples as well. Um, so I want to just say a few, um, few modern ways of thinking about the Song of Songs. Um, first, traditional Catholic. Um, in his book, Behold the Pierced One, um, Pope Benedict used the Song of Songs to develop his, um, his vision of a way of seeing Christ that is not only spiritual, but embodied and in, uh, involving the senses. And for him, this sensual embodied love draws on Song of Songs. Song of Songs is what shows us that we need to, as Catholics, love Christ in a physical way, in a physical form. Um, so in this, he draws a line between God's love for us and the physical love in, that's described in Song of Songs. All right, traditional Jewish. John Levinson's book of biblical theology, The Love of God, um, which traces the idea of God's love through the Bible and concludes that as a co covenantal love, it has elements of both inequality and mutuality. There's no such thing as equality between humans and God, obviously. The way that covenants worked is that they were set up as a mechanism of inequality, but the Song of Songs shows us that there could still be love between, between them, even though there is inequality. So that there is mutuality, even though there is inequality, and that is what covenant looks like. 
Um, Phyllis Tribble, a feminist Bible scholar writing in the 1970s, um, she reads the Song of Songs as an inversion of the Garden of Eden story. In the Garden of Eden story, there's a creation of inequality. There's a creation of gender roles that create inequality. The Song of Songs is a return to the garden. She draws on the nature imagery, which is something that I haven't pointed out, but that is very strong in Song of Songs. Um, this nature imagery, this return to the garden, the leaving the palace, you start in the, it, starts in the, it starts in the palace and goes to the mountain of spices. So the going back into the garden, um, and back to the garden is the back to the Garden of Eden. This undoing of inequality, the, the dominance of the female voice. She notices that when the, the woman brings the man back to her, to her home, she brings her back to her, him back to her mother's house, indicating, hey, that's in, we're not in a patriarchy, right? If, if it's your mother's house and not your father's house. So the Garden of Eden is the undoing of the, of, sorry, the Song of Songs is the undoing of patriarchy and the return to the garden. Um, Toni Morrison in Song of Solomon um, writes, it's a novel, fiction, but she writes about the descendants of a man named Shalimar or Solomon who flew away or perhaps died, and these descendants sometimes succeed and sometimes struggle in their work to love themselves and each other and to affirm their essential worthiness of, of love. In all of these cases, Song of Songs is a way of, of affirming the love for a community, for a specific group of people, saying this category of people is worthy of God's love, is possessed of God's love, is entitled to God's love, and is able to express God's love in a particular way. Um, Song of Songs is a way of claiming God's love. It's also a way of retelling the Bible as about love. Shai held in his new book, Judaism is About Love, so um, what, he ends with the Song of Songs. Now, he deals with many different kinds of love in his book. But again, by concluding with the Song of Songs, love is foundational to the religious experience. So using the Song of Songs as a matrix for retelling the Bible makes the Bible about love, centers love in your relationship with God. But the nature of romantic love is that it can feel exclusive. And that can propose a challenge because this can make the Bible into a contested text. If you tell the story of the Bible as a story about God's love for you, does that leave room for God's love for, any, for anyone else? So that's a hard problem. I want to end with a new old interpretation that may give us some hints there. I say new because I actually just recently came across it in a pop culture artifact. Um, the TV show Mrs. Davis, I don't know if anyone saw it on Peacock. It's about a nun on a quest to destroy AI. Um, she, it's, it's also hilarious. Um, so her name is Sister Simone, and as a nun, so her spirituality is expressed through marriage to God, marriage to Christ. And this is in the show so, shown, I mean, Jesus is a character in the show, and it's shown using romantic, erotic, sexualized Song of Songs imagery. So she's shown lying with him, um, his left hand under her head is right embracing her, lines from Song of Songs. He's shown giving her food, right, food imagery, feeding, it's also from Song of Songs. Um, and she, her emotional character arc in the show, a lot of it is about recognizing that just as she is married to God, so too are many other people. Um, part of her character arc is she's looking at out for another, she's looking for another character who's very important, and at point, some point she realizes that this woman also had an intense spiritual experience, and she realizes this woman was intimate with her husband. And she goes to him and says, do you love her? And he says to her, and you can tell he means it, I love everyone. 
All right. <laughs> um, I'm saying this is old because um, Origen, very influential early Christian Bible commentary, second, third century, um, in his interpretation of Song of Songs, the, the bride, the protagonist of the Song of Songs, is one of many women married to the bridegroom. She goes into the bridegroom's chamber with many other women. When she says, draw me after you, let us run, she's with a group of women. That's a, it's a little odd to think about. It might be even a little painful to think about. But he can imagine love for God in a way that's not exclusive. Um, similarly, um, Origen was in conversation with rabbis um, who were writing Midrash, and Midrash Rabbah on Song of Songs points this out. He said, so the King Solomon um, was certainly not monogamous. He was maybe the least monogamous person who ever lived, um, or certainly up there. Um, and uh, in Song of Songs, it says there's 60, there's, uh, 60 wives, 80 concubines. I may be getting the number wrong, um, but it's large numbers. Um, and um, Midrash Rabbah says, yeah, these, these are the nations. These are the nations. These are the other nations. Okay. So the idea is, so we know about our love story with God. We don't, there might be others that we don't know about. But that can be a hard thing to think about. Um, Scheihild mentions this possibility also in his, uh, in his book. That, that, and that, that can be challenging to think about. If we want to take seriously that we love God and God loves us, how to make room for the possibility that God might love everyone. So what I want to conclude with, I left with some questions to think about when you're reading the Bible. Like I said at the beginning, the Bible doesn't say things. It's not, it's a book, can't talk. You're a person, you read, and you make choices. So some questions to think about when you're thinking about what choices you're making. Where do you start? What other places in the Bible, do you connect to these places where you start? How do you make the connection? What else from outside the Bible do you bring in? Do you want to bring in your contemporary reality also? Do you think that's also from God? And then a couple bonus questions at the end. How do I make this my story? How do I tell the story of the Bible in a way that it is about my relationship with God? And how can I make space for other readings? How can I hear that even though I am retelling the Bible as about God's love for me, there might be room for another people, other people to read it in a different way? All right, thank you. So much. I think we have some time for questions, and I just wanted to start with one, um, which is actually, thank you so much, it was so enriching. Um, so the Nicholas of Lyra um, quote um, in, in the interpretation says that Jews inappropriately apply some things which pertain to the New Testament to the Old, while conversely, Catholic interpreters inappropriately apply some things from the Old Testament to the New. So I'm just curious, um, what do you make of this statement, and how... Um, what does it reveal about, like, maybe the challenges and the rewards of interfaith interpretation? Uh -huh. I want to open it up afterwards, right, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. If you, when you go into the text of Nicholas of Lyra's commentary, it, it, actually most of the Song of Songs is about the Hebrew Bible, which is on the one hand shocking, on the other hand, if you actually look at a copy of the Christian Bible, most of it is the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to open it up to the large group here. Um, there's a lot to digest, so please uh, dive in. I'll walk around with the mic. Anyone? 
Did I see a hand? <laughs> yes. Oh, awesome. If one thinks of the text as a story between, a love story between God and God's children, then it makes sense that there's enough love for each child. So that's the perspective that I look at that story in because as a mother of multiple children, I love them all as different as they may be. And I think that that for me is the inherent message in the Song of Songs. So if you're looking for biblical metaphors which describe us as God's children, they definitely exist. But that's not Song of Songs. <laughs> Song of Songs is definitely, it's, it's, it's romantic love, physical, sexual. Um, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, It's interesting, I mean, you think about love, a relationship with God as love between parent and child. There's also Mara Benjamin's work in which you think about God as the child in the relationship, as the, as the, as the, the, the because w when we experience commandedness, we, and we think, we, commandedness from someone we love, so children, uh, we love our children, and sometimes, we you know, when the baby's crying in the middle of the night, you gotta get up and do stuff, so. Um, yeah, people, some people are hesitant about Song of Songs because, uh, because of the challenges of it and don't see it as the best model for, um, for relationship with God for, for the reason that you point out and might choose the parent-child model instead. Yeah. Any other? Oh, good. I just discovered I have a second mic. So <laughs> good to keep that. Thank you so much, Devoy. That was wonderful. I, I was struck by your comment or your point at the beginning of the um, of your talk, where you mentioned that that everyone, or at least the classic, every ancient and classical commentator assumes a unity of character, place, setting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But whereas you point out, they're actually disparate love um, poems. So I was just wondering: was there any kind of self awareness about that? Is it, or is it just this overriding assumption that if it's collected together in one book in the Bible, there must be a unity? It's, I don't know if that makes that question makes sense. Was there any kind of awareness that they were projecting onto the text? So what's, what I think shows it is how different the stories are from each other. Um, so even Ezra, who's writing about the same time as Rashi, tells a dramatically different story. So Rashi's story, one of the things about it is that it's non-linear. It goes back and forward in time. Um, even as her story is much more linear. And his, his story is um, a shepherd girl sees uh, a shepherd boy, and she sees him, and he says, he's so beautiful, I would love him more than any king. And all the monarchy stuff is just how infatuated she is with him. Um, and it's rather than an estranged couple, it's all about how much she wants him and how much she is pursuing him. So on the one hand, it's a simpler story, but on the other hand, it's much more about female agency. Um, so yeah, you, did, you do get very different stories in the different commentators about what they think is actually happening between the two characters. Um. <clears throat> I have a question that kind of builds off Brent's question, because in addition to um, commentary traditions uh, that we've been talking about that assume that there's, there's one plot and one thing about the text, there's also, of course, uh, modern uh, traditions of interpretation that think there is one way of explaining the text. Uh, usually, like, it's, you know, something like it's a book of erotic poetry, um, and all this kind of meaning has been added onto it, but is actually not necessary to. So um, I'm wondering, because what you've been presenting is a really interesting kind of, you know, multivalent uh, interpretive approach. Um, 
how does how does your uh, the approach you've been presenting relate to that kind of modern approach, and and how is it received vis-a-vis um, -vis that approach? I'm just interested. So, all I I descriptively, what I would say is that when someone is taking that approach, um, the choices that they are making is to read the different texts separately, to add in context sometimes from other sources outside the Bible, but not rather than other biblical stories, um, maybe to bring in other kinds of assumptions about how literature works. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna say that's wrong. I'm gonna say that like these other kinds of reading, that's a kind of reading that is making certain choices. Thank you so much for a rich talk. My mind is racing. Folks that know me know I have 6,000 questions. I'm only gonna ask two. Um, I loved how you ended this sense that love is a principle for how to read scripture and the Bible, as you say. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about why so many medieval commentators were drawn to the Song of Songs as their way in to the biblical text. And if you might also share a little bit for us how to think about when we make these choices, because the Bible doesn't say stuff, it's a mute text, it's a book on a table. How do we think about the ways in which we're choosing our principle of where to get started? I resonate with love and I bring a Catholic Christian perspective to that, where I know I have a theology where God is love, so that's my way in. But I'm wondering, are there ways to even reflect on those choices as well? Ooh, two really good questions. <laughs> Um, I'll start with the second question, and then you might have to remind me about the first question. Um, so, ha so factors to consider when you're making your choices. So for people who are within a community, and honestly, I think we're all within a community. I think, um, I, yeah, I, none of us are autonomous, completely autonomous free agents. But for those of us who are within a community, um, our community gives us certain kinds of questions to ask of texts, and then we can either accept them or reject them. Um, there are, if, if you come into to the biblical text, say as an observant Jew, you might start by assuming a relationship with God, assuming that the relationship with God is expressed through practice, um, assuming that the history of interpretation is meaningful, also assuming that the text can have multiple possible interpretations, right? Those might be some starting points for how you might begin to read a text. Um, but there are definitely other starting points you could start from. You could start from the starting point that the text is an ancient text that reflects a worldview that's different from ours, that our role is to separate ourselves from the values embedded in the text, to look critically at the values in the text. Um, if you might think about what has this text done to or for people in my community? Um, so two resources that I wanna recommend that I think um, do a good job of spelling out options for kinds of questions to ask. Um, Tick for Frymer Kensky's book um, on women in the Bible um, begins by introducing um, active reading. And she approaches active reading very much as an autonomous practice. Um, so she starts with, um, you can ignore interpretation and make your own choices. So you might be coming out of a tradition but you can decide which interpretations from that tradition you want to hold on to and which interpretations you want to look for alternatives to. And then you can use, and here are some other tools you can use to find al alternative readings. Um, another resource that I want to re recommend um, is, the, again, the introduction to um, Reverend Will Gaffney's book, Womanist Midrash. Um, she gives in her introduction a list of questions that she asks of a biblical text, um, which include things like, how do power relationships operate in this text? How has this text been used to harm black women and girls? 
How has this text been used helpfully by black women and girls? How can this text function as scripture for black women and girls? So coming out of a community that she is responsible for, how can this text speak to and speak lovingly to this community? Yeah. Um, all right, why love, why Song of Songs? Um, so, why love? You know, why not love, right? Like, I mean, that's, that um, when you, that to have a meaningful spiritual experience, you want to feel like God loves you, right? Um, but, but Song of Songs, first of all, it's a problem text. It's not obvious why it's in the Bible at all. It's not obvious what this love poetry has to do with the rest of the Bible. And then, even once you're reading it, it's not, like, even once you grant this is love poetry, it's in the Bible, it's not obvious how to interpret it. If you're gonna, gonna read it as a single story, it's not obvious how to construct the story. By the way, reading it as a, as a collection of poems doesn't make it easier to interpret because then you have to figure out where the breaks are between the poems and that's also not obvious because, okay, so why do people read it as unified? Because there, although there is no continuity in plot, character, and setting, there is a great deal of continuity in imagery, language, and theme, which makes it very, very hard to see breaks between poems. <laughs> so I'm, I wanna be clear, I'm not making any argument about authorship, that they were written by different people or that they were originally separate poems or anything like that, because there's so much continuity in imagery, language, and theme. <laughs> so they, the, the poem, yeah. So, so whether you're reading it as one or as many, it's a problem text. It's meaty, there's a lot to look at there. It can keep a biblical exegete busy for years. <laughs> um, and you can come up with many different interpretations. And whatever interpretation you come up with, you're gonna feel good about. Um, we were talking before about um, different ways to interpret Song of Songs. Um, the one I've talked about today is the approach of reading Song of Songs as God and God's people, but there are others. Um, another way to read Song of Songs, which we talked about over lunch, is um, God and the individual soul, God and the individual longing soul. Um, so Bernard of Clairvaux, John of the Cross, um, and there's Jewish parallels to this as well. Um, the individual believer who longs for God, who searches for God, who sometimes is close to God, who sometimes is distant from God, who sometimes feels like a king and sometimes feels like a shepherd, like who sometimes is, who, who, or sorry, it's, sorry, the individual soul is usually the, the female character. So it's used, so sometimes feels like a queen and sometimes like a goat herd. So it's, um, so uh, yeah, I, it, can be, it, it can be the story of your nation. It can also be your own story. There's a lot to find there. Well, I think we have time for one more. Um, do you, and I'm, I'm wondering if any of the students have any questions. Um, if not, I have a question, but just feel free to jump in, or anyone. Final, final question? Oh. I would like to say that I really love that talk. It's inspired a lot of thoughts, and I haven't quite got a lot of questions to do, but you mentioned something about Song of Songs interpretation as an undoing of patriarchy. I didn't quite catch on to what you said, but can you say more about that, please? Sure. Um, this was uh, Phyllis Tribble's interpretation that um, the Song of Songs is when the, when the woman takes, reclaims what was lost in the Garden of Eden. So, you, so, in some ways, like Rashi and like Nicholas of Lyra, she uses the Song of Songs to retell the story of the Bible. You can imagine the Bible looking kind of like this. In the beginning, man and woman were created equal, equally in God's image. And then there was a terrible tragedy, a terrible breakage. And man and woman were separated from each other. Man and woman was cursed to be subordinate to man. Um, they were expelled from the garden. Song of Songs and its poetic language in which it's mostly the woman speaking tells a different kind of story. Something that might be taking place in the future but it's a future that's also embodied in the present. Whenever a man and a woman or 
just two women or women, commit to just loving and loving in a way that is equal. Um, and by loving in a way that is equal, they can return to the garden. Um, when she takes him back to her mother's house. So what is patriarchy? Patriarchy is rule of the father. In the rule of the father, there's no such thing as a mother's house. Mothers don't own houses, only fathers own houses. Um, when she takes him back to her mother's house, she's saying, this is a, we're in a different world. We're in a world that, doesn't, that is not a patriarchal world. We're going we're gonna to love each other in a world in which women have agency. Also, she takes him back, which is different from a world under patriarchy in which men claim women. She chooses the man that she wants to be with and sets up a different kind of world. I think that's a perfect place to end. So thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. <laughs>